Please welcome Jessica. Afternoon, everyone. Um, it doesn't matter how many times I speak, I still feel nervous coming on this stage. And in this instance, I'm very privileged that I'm at PyCon Africa. So I'm glad to have you guys here with me. I will be talking about Python communities, especially Python in Namibia. And the question still is, is this Python thing working? So I want, to make your own, I want you to make your own conclusions at the end of my talk, but uh, yeah, let me share my experience with you. I am Jessica Upani, or Miss Upani as my kids call me, but not for you. <laughs> yes, so find me on Twitter, I'm, at, I'm Jessica Upani, and also you can email me. Don't ask me about the email, I did it back then when I was still in high school. Right, so I would like to go over a little bit about what PyCons have been doing in the past few years, especially in Africa. Now, if we look at 2010, between 2010 and 2014, we had only one PyCon in Africa. That was PyCon South Africa. And um, during the time of 2014, 2013, there was some activity of PyCons in Cameroon, but I don't know what happened. I need to talk to my brothers in Cameroon and find out exactly what happened. But between those years, there was a lot of activity in South Africa only. Um, maybe also in some African countries, but it wasn't popular. And according to DSF, there were no requests for funding during that period of time except for PyCon South Africa. And then between 2015 and 2016, in 2015 we had Python Namibia um, for the first time. And then in 2016, there was uh, PyCon Zimbabwe, um, led by Anna Makaruzi and Humphrey, and the rest of the PyCon Zim uh, group. We have a lot of them here as well. Then in 2017 and 2018, we saw PyCon Nigeria, we saw PyCon Ghana, we also saw PyCon Kenya. And then finally, we are here and we are at PyCon Africa. So congratulations to everyone. Right, so let's talk about my baby. I want to share this experience with you, but um, this is also to show you that every community is unique in its own way. We are one of the oldest communities in, in Africa, but if you look at PyCon Ghana, if you look at or Python Nigeria, these guys are going at a very fast pace. So I want to share our experience with you and show you that whatever your, your situation is in your country, it's unique and it's going to be special and um, you should be happy about it. Right, so in 2015 we had 80 participants, we had uh, 10 talks and 9 workshops. Half of these was university students. And then in 2016, we had 110 participants, 15 talks, and 10 workshops. But as you can see, the numbers are now going down. In 2017, we had 93 participants only, 20 talks, and 6 workshops. 2018, we again experienced less participants, 82 participants, 21 talks, 13 workshops. And this year, we even experienced a worse attendance, which was 75, uh, 15 talks, and 12 workshops. Hopefully, I will have more workshops from Togo, Benin, Kenya, Botswana. I need more of this. My list is getting down and down, so I need help from you guys as well. Um, these numbers are just to encourage us to do more work on the ground. Um, when it comes to Python events or Python conferences, it's not about just the conference itself. It's about engaging the community after the conference. So this low number shows us that we need to do a lot more work locally and have more events for our people. Right. Now, now I want to talk about the Python communities that we have in my country. Um, we have Pinam Scholars. Pinam Scholars is our baby. This is one of the things that we did when we created the society. At that time, we still didn't know what we were doing, but we were passionate about high school learners and in getting them involved in um, coding, and so, we, this is our pride. This is something that we work on um, almost every day, more than any other event in my country. But um, here where my colleague is going to talk more in detail on how we 
uh, how we made it successful. Right now, we are working with eight schools, and we have three more uh, schools that are coming up very soon that we are partnering with. Um, yeah, so Panam Scholars is basically coding clubs, Python coding clubs in high schools, and they have been quite successful because we have had uh, one of our schools also winning the national uh, programming competition. So this is going really well. Uh, his talk will now go into detail on how we make it happen and how we engage with the teachers. We also have Jungle Girls. So far we have only had it in Winduk. Um, right now I'm going to be looking for girls to kind of lead this and also take it outside of Ventuk. Um, because so far we have only had it in, in Ventuk. We also have Python for Data Science. This one started this year and it started as spy ladies. The lady who's leading it started as spy ladies. But in the group we saw that there was a, a huge interest um, of guys as well who wanted to join and learn Python. And so she changed the name to, for, to Python for data science. So now we are left with starting all over and looking for someone to lead the pi ladies in Namibia. Uh, we also have Django Namibia, which is led by Muhewe. He started it this year and he has a lot of plans um, towards the end of this year. But this is also uh, something new and it's our baby. Um, and then pi ladies. So the, the, the community doesn't exist right now. We are working on getting more girls to lead it. Um, then we also have carpentry workshops. These are workshops that are mainly focusing on, re on research software. We also have them in my country. Right, so when we organize all these events, one of the things that we struggle with in my country is sort of motivating the people to keep learning Python, right? So the way our job market is right now is that it's dominated by Java, it's dom dominated by PHP, and people don't really see the need of using Python, right? So how do you get people to come to your events, learn Python, and be able to implement it in their workspace? Because there are no jobs in my country that requires Python. So one of the um, challenges that we have in my country is sort of motivating people to keep coming to your workshops, even if you don't have any job to offer them. Okay? Um, now what we do is that we, most of the programmers that are good in my country go for international jobs. So now our job as a community is to say, okay, fine, we can't necessarily offer you jobs right now in, in the country that are Python related, but look for jobs outside the country. So we give them, for example, links or direction on where to get jobs. So if we see them, we share them in our groups. And then we also want to promote remote jobs to them as well. We have a training coming up in August now, and we have talks that are specifically going to focus on how to get remote jobs, for example. So these are things that we are actively doing to try and engage the community and keep them there and show them hope. Um, yeah. So we also um, have talks on how to start a business, especially in my country. So we have some people who have started their companies who will be coming to discuss how one can start their own, um, I guess, tech company or anything like that. So we are kind of now looking for other ways to compensate for not being able to offer jobs to our community. Right, so Python in academia in my country is in such a way that in schools right now, we don't have a specific language that, that is recommended by the government. So if you are a teacher, depending on whatever skills you have, any programming language, you choose that language and you teach your kids in that language. And it's more like an extracurricular type of event because kids are only required to know programming when they are in their final year where they have to create projects and so forth. So if you are in the junior grade, you're not required to know any programming. But as a teacher, it's your own choice to kind of engage the kids into programming. And as a society, we decided that we needed to go into the schools and engage the kids into programming, even though the school system doesn't force the kids to know programming. I myself came to university wanting to do computer science, but didn't know anything about computer science or programming until I came to university. So it was just a dream because I had it somewhere, I don't know even where. And then I came to university, I met Java, and then I wanted to quit. So I needed to rectify that mistake because it, it wasn't going to happen on my watch. Right, so uh, Python in universities is now at a good stage. We have three universities in my country. So uh, at the University of Namibia, it's in a diploma level, and at the other two universities, it's in the uh, undergrad degrees, so it's quite good in the universities, but at the school level it's not there yet. So what we are trying to do now is 
Okay, fine, the government maybe doesn't want to adopt Python as the main language, but we are going to teach the most high school teachers, we are going to have the most active uh, scholars groups in the country in such a way that we dominate the system, even though it's not adopted by the government as they might, right? So, um, because in, in most cases, if you, if, you, if, you, if you have been a teacher, if you have worked with teachers, you understand that most teachers don't know how to program. Okay, so if you come in and you come in with the community and you're able to train these people, you will get them on your side. So whether we are doing it there or you want to do it in your country, you have to know that these guys don't have support. And most of them don't even know how to program. So if you give them a community where they can learn and be comfortable in the language, they might be able to convert and come to your language. So that's what we are working on right now in my country. And hopefully maybe it will be adopted in, in the school system by the government. All right, so let's talk about the challenges that we have been experiencing in my country. One of them is commitment, and commitment is not only uh, by participants not coming to your events, it's also the executive members not wanting to do the work or not committing to coming to meetings or completing their tasks in time, and also the teachers themselves. Sometimes we, we, we have to really go on their case to be able to get the work done, but everyone, you will experience this in everything, whether it's people signing up for your events and not showing up, or uh, maybe uh, your executive members not wanting to do a job or something. So as an executive or as a leader, a community leader, you have to know that you are going to be dealing with uh, commitment issues. So you need a lot of patience. Right, so one of the other things that we deal with is uh, not being taken seriously. So what happens is the following. We offer buses for university students to come to Paco Namibia, and what they do is they don't sign up for tickets. They don't buy tickets. They want free tickets. You give them, they don't show up, or they don't even ask for a free ticket. When they see a bus coming during the lunch hour time, they get on it, they come to the conference, and then they go away. University students, don't do that. So, or sometimes you, you are having a workshop training, you, you put out applications, they don't apply, but they will write after you close the applications that they are interested. Okay, so people don't take you seriously, and this is something that you have to deal with. Lack of resources as well. This is a very big issue in my country. We have computer systems that still use XP, Windows XP. So you have to go into Python and go to maybe the one version 2014 or whatever. That's the only one that will work in their systems. And if you install it, it doesn't allow a lot of learners to log into the computers. You have 20 computers, only three or six are going to log in at once. The rest are not working. You don't know what's wrong. So that's the challenge that you're having right now. But again, this is not something that you told you back. What I do right now is I take the kids, if I have a school that is interested in programming, I'll take it to a university, I'll talk to a university. Saturday morning from 10 to 12, I give them lessons whenever I'm available. But we don't give excuses. <laughs> yes. In some countries as well, some learners have laptops. So in such a case, if you have a group of learners, some have laptops, some don't, then you come together, those who have laptops, you share, you pair program and it works. It does really work. Language delivery. This is not something that I experience in my country. Most of uh, my people speak English, so it's not a big barrier. Even though we have so many native languages, we all are able to speak English and it's not a problem. But um, in, language, in countries like Mozambique, for example, or in Cameroon, where you have one part of the country speaking French and the other part speaking English and not, uh, they don't speak one of the, of the other languages, this is something that you may come across. And now we have to think of ways to overcome that. If you are a French-speaking part of Cameroon and you want to interact with the English people, learn English or vice versa, okay? Be the first, even if your community doesn't want you to do it or whatever the case may be. And then we have Mozambique, for example. Mozambique, uh, I think they speak Portuguese. And then maybe they want to have a conference, an international conference, where we speak English, for example, and we don't understand their language. So we have to think of ways on how to work around that. Whether looking at other conferences that have done it before or 
just understanding our community and seeing can we bring translators or what is it that we can do to compensate for that. One other thing you struggle with is also funding. Since 2015, my team has operated with zero um, budget until now. Only this year were we able to have a little bit of funding to do anything. Everything else that we did before, we did it on a zero budget. That means that we had to dig out of our own pockets to get things done if we needed them. Every meeting you go to, every event you go to to represent the society, you are doing it out of your own pocket. Every t-shirt of the society you want to wear to an event, you have to do it out of your own pocket. You have a workshop, it costs you maybe 1,500, maybe a million dollars, 1,500 rand, maybe it will, it will <laughs> it's easier to translate or to convert your currency. That you have to raise within the society. So we operated without funding, so that might be also a problem uh, that you will experience. Now, what are the lessons that we have learned? You do not need a lot of people to start. In the beginning, we would have a workshop. We advertise it as much as we can. Only two people from the community shows up. So we make sure that all the executives show up so that we attend our own workshop. <laughs> and today, we have people coming to our workshop. So you do it. Right, so whatever challenges are there, refuse to let them put you down. What, I don't care what challenge it is. Make sure that you find a way out of it because the way exists, okay? And run your own race. I see Python Nigeria, I see Python Ghana, I'll mention it as many times, and I'm like, how do these guys do this? I need strong people like this in my community, you understand? But when you look at the people that are in my country, we are two million only in the whole country, and we, we are not very competitive, okay? Maybe in Nigeria everyone wants to go, go, go. In my country, people are chilled. <laughs> I have to understand my community. You understand? So we go at a very slow but steady pace. We work with the community that we have. I'm not going to be stressed about how Ghana is going or how Nigeria is going. I'm going to work with my community. I understand how they work and I work with that and make sure that we are moving forward. So in your case, you have to also understand your community. What is it that they are struggling with? How is your community? How can you work around it? I had to be, I organized a meeting, I remind them the day before, the next meeting, uh, the next day, 20 minutes within the meeting time, I'm calling them, where are you? Oh, yeah, we had a meeting, 20 minutes after. I had to be patient. That time I'm very mad, I'm very, very, very mad. But I had to grow the patience because otherwise, it's the community that you're working with, you have to understand it, okay? Right. You need a support system. I always need a shoulder to cry on. I always need someone to uh, question my thinking. I always need someone who can help me make the decisions. Alone, you can never do this. It's time consuming and you will burn out very, very fast. Whether it's someone close to you, like an executive or a friend, try to do that, but not your partner. You will drain them. Okay. So always have a shoulder to cry on. For example, I look up to Daniele, I, I give all my complaints to him and he calms me down. Even when I want to quit, he will always calm me down. Okay, so find a shoulder to cry on. One more thing, this is a voluntary thing, it's not like it's a job for you, so you have to make sure that if you are going into it, you are going to spend your free time to do all the work. There's no payment for it. Yes, you might need to spend your own money. We have spent a lot of our own money in this society and today it's working. So you have to know that even though you are going to spend some money of your own, it will always work out. Or at least you have to make sure that one of the days it will work out. Because for us it did work out, okay? But be ready to spend some money. And it is a commitment. You spend so many hours. You spend so many hours. I can only imagine how many sleepless nights the organizing team has been having these days to make it happen. And for me, myself, I always 
came to a verge of being fired because of the time I had to spend organizing these events. I remember one day I had I marked scripts, they were late, and I had a two-day workshop, and then I worked that last day, I worked until five, and the principal was so mad, he wanted me to be at school the following morning and bring the scripts and enter the marks, and I said, yes, sir. The following morning I didn't show up because I had a workshop that was waiting for me, and so I sent the scripts with my sister, and he was very, very mad. How I didn't get fired, I don't know. But from that day onward, he knew that this was important to me and whatever trip I had to go to, he just said, I will allow you anyway because you will not listen to me. <laughs> so some, some jobs, I could have been fired. I could have been fired. I can't just work anyway. You understand? So it's a huge commitment. You will spend so many hours doing this. It's not just easy. And look for ways to contribute. Today you are a participant, next year you are a participant, the year after that you are a participant. Why? You at least come this year, someone else spend their time to organize, you go back, you find a way to contribute, okay? Don't just be a participant, okay? Go back home and try to find ways to contribute back to the community. Now, why should you start a Python community in your country? Why do this? You are here because someone else spent a lot of time organizing this, isn't it? Why not? Why not organize this? I'm sure you are going to be meeting a lot of people, learning new things. Why not do the same for someone else to have the same experience? Why not? By doing this, you are also enhancing the local capacity. So the developers in your country, for example, you'll be able to see what type of developers do I have. What can we do to improve that capacity? As an organizer of such events, you have that power to do that. So this is also for the benefit of the community in your country. You are also increasing your global visibility. So people like Brightco, for example, they come from America and wherever they come and attend your own events here in, locally. They pick up some good developers. And you know you are creating job opportunities for your own people. And then you also create a support system for the beginners. If you look at the Java language, for example, they don't have any support system. I get stuck, I go out. Because there's no one who's going to help me, for example. But in, by doing Python communities, you know that all the newcomers, they will be feeling comfortable learning Python because they know they have so many people to ask from. So this is a great way uh, for them to start. You also are filling the gap. So for example, in our case with Pinam scholars, you know that scholars are disadvantaged when it comes to programming. As a leader or a community leader, you have that power to train these people. So that when they go to university, they are skilled, okay? I said I was going to speak for 20 minutes, now it's 25, so I'm running out of time. Right, so there are also other personal benefits like friendships. In my case, I made friends with the likes of Anna, Candy, Irene, and so forth, and Marlene as well. PyCon Africa came as an idea of, or as a result of just us missing each other. Instead of seeing each other once a year, we're like, why can we not just have an event for all of us where we just meet, you know? We are excited to see each other every year, and today we have PyCon Africa. So you make so many friendships, you also get job opportunities, and you also have travel opportunities. You don't necessarily want to organize these events because you want to travel around the world, but this is something that also comes as an opportunity to you. And we can't deny it, okay? Right, so how do you get started uh, very quickly? Jungle Girls is a good initiative to start. It's a, a way for you to even get a group of girls together for pie ladies. So you can start by organizing a workshop attend other conferences, especially African conferences. This gives you a realistic idea of what a conference can be in your own country, especially if you are a beginner. You go to Europe, you are seeing 400 participants, people are paying, are buying their tickets, and companies are interested in, in sponsoring, they're even reaching out to the conference team. You come back in Africa, you only have 75 people, and companies don't want to sponsor you. So when you attend, local conferences in Africa, you get a realistic idea of what is possible and you don't have high expectations that are never going to necessarily be the case if you are starting. 
You can also reach out to other communities. Um, I remember in 2017, uh, Abigail wrote an email to me asking about Pi Ladies in Namibia. At that time, we didn't have any, but that's a nice way that she started. And now today, she's excelling and she's one of the best Pi Ladies leaders in Africa. Yeah. And then follow, follow other, social media, other, other societies on social media. Watch what they are doing, see the activities that they are doing, see ways that they are engaging with their community, and then you also learn something from that. And then go back and plow in your community. You have learned a lot now. Now for you to start your own community, you just start a small event or a jungle girls event or whatever something. Okay? So what does the future look like? This is something that I want to learn from you guys as well. Maybe you can have a conversation with me later on and tell me what you think we should do as community leaders in Africa, okay? Now, here are my ideas. Start thinking of ways to generate your own income. I think for a long time we rely so much on international funding and so forth. It's time for us to start thinking of ways to generate our own money. I know we are used to being the victim and all this, but we are capable. All of us are great developers. You work for that big company, that nice company that you want to mention to all your friends. You could start a similar company that your fellow Africans can also be proud of and say, I work for that company which you started. And that could be a way to generate money for your own community. Okay, so we can start thinking of ways to make money with this money, we can build community hubs of our own. We don't need to always ask. We can find ways to find money to be able to build our own community hubs, which we work hard for ourselves, and also create jobs for the fellow communities, not just you looking for jobs abroad and so forth. Start up something. Create jobs for the community. Partner with startups, whether they are local or they are international, and these are ways that one can also create jobs for your local communities, and more importantly, expose, expose the scholars to technology, whether it's working in, with engineering, maybe equipment, I don't know, engineering stuff, don't ask me. But you, you could try something like that. You could, you know, kids don't know what they don't know. You understand? So if you have some servers or some company that stores data, whatever it does, Expose the kids to these things so that they can start thinking big while they are still young. If they haven't seen these things, they don't know these things. So try to find ways to expose them as well. And let's dominate the education system. Let's dominate the education system. This is very, very important. Because if these things are not taught in school, kids are, people are not, the community is not familiar with this. So the first point is to dominate the education system, whether it's university, or getting uh, Python adopted in high schools or whatever. You have to think of ways to dominate the education system. And also international presence. When people come from other countries to come and attend your local events, for example, your people feel proud. They feel like they are in, their events are important and so forth, okay? So let's try to do this for our community. And then create new ideas. This is now up to you to say, so what do we do as young people in our own communities? We have this pipe on Africa. So now what do we do moving forward from here? How can we make this organization support or give back to our own countries? What can we do with pipe on Africa? Can we one day maybe have a university, Python university that is free, where our developers can go and learn intense programming? Can one day can we have our own programming language in Africa, for example? What does the future look like for us? I want to learn from you guys who are young and fresh and in college and finished and everything. Let's have this type of conversations, whether on Twitter or even locally or something. Let's think beyond what we know now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jessica. While we're getting set up for the panel that's starting in a couple of minutes, maybe you have uh, some questions for Jessica. You'd like to have some questions? 
Yes, we'll try and keep them short and sweet, but please. Jessica, let me ask you a question. Where do you think you're going to be in five years from now with this? What, what's going to happen? Right, so this is what I was thinking, right? I don't have jobs right now in my country. So what I want to do now is redefine the job market and start our own company a company where my developers or the Python community developers are going to volunteer at, and whatever projects we work on, whatever funding we get from these projects is reinvested back in the community. That's my dream right now. Thanks a lot for the talk. The talk. I'd like to contribute uh, quickly about uh, the income part, and I'd also like to answer the talk before because the the presenter was talking about linking the industry to the developers, etc., etc. And I have this strange feeling that nobody is talking about contributing to free and open source software. I'm not saying that contributing to open source will bring money directly, but it is certainly a way for you to get some kind of exposure outside of your country, and in some ways to be, to be able to find jobs. If I, if I talk about myself, I'm living in Senegal, and most of the jobs, most of the people I had the chance to work with, it is actually because I'm contributing to some software for which I'm not mandatory paid, but seeing the kind of contribution, the contribution I'm making, there is some people who Hello? came to me like, okay, can you work on this project? This is what I want. So yeah, contributing to open source software is a way to. Thank you. Any other contribution or question? Thank you, my sister, for the beautiful presentation. Today is my first time coming to this community. I actually learned of this community from my daughter. She is also here. The thing interesting to me is the age gap. When somebody took uh, statistics, there's anybody above 35 or so. So we are very few here. So I'm coming into the community also because I believe that we have domain knowledge in the industry. So if we have domain knowledge, we want to be the gap or the bridge between the programmer and the industry. So if one can fit into that bridge, I'll be so glad to do that. Then get into your own contribution. You also need to enter our government if you want funding for your, for your conferences. It's not a thing that should come from your pocket. So the marketing effort should be very, 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 very uh, important to you. So apart from government, you also go to the industries. If you don't sell what you are doing here to the industries, you will not get anything. Because what you are also doing here is like you are just you know, training people for foreign markets. So if you train for foreign markets, you know, in Africa, who knows what is going on? Many industries, when you are talking to them, they don't even know what is the BI. Once they see Microsoft, and that is the end. So please, let's just do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if you have any questions, you can reach out to me later on. But now we have to start with the panel discussion.